Are food prices today as high as they were in the 1970s? We'll find out on today's episode of Macro Peace Theater. I'm your narrator, Emil Kalinowski, and today's tale is taught to us by historian, economist, author, Adam Tuesd. We're going to his substack, adamtuesd.substack.com, October 24th, 2021, Crisis Talk, Global Food Prices. You can find Adam there as well as on Twitter at Adam underscore twos. And ladies and gentlemen, you may be thinking, of course they are. So that's Emil sort of hinting that they are. But you know what? Maybe they're not. Now there is one data set that does say they are. But guess what Mr. Twos does? He investigates and he finds that that may not be the case. It may not be. Let's talk about it. The economic news right now is filled with talk of inflation, energy price hikes, and shortages. There is even a mini strike wave. Striketober is a thing. References to the 1970s are everywhere. Stagflation, the combination of low growth and inflation characteristics of the 1970s, has become one of the most searched terms on news terminals. Personally, I invoke crises a lot. In my new book, Shutdown, Polycrisis is a key term, but I'm skeptical about this current crisis discourse. Perhaps it is an effect of having recently taught Mikhail Kaletsky's classic 1943 essay on the manipulative politics of confidence discourse. As Kaletsky explains in Economic Policy Debate, talk of confidence is not innocent. It is a way for business leaders and their spokespeople to set the agenda in economic policy. Who, after all, is to judge whether business has lost confidence or not? Crisis talk is often the flip side of confidence talk. And in the current moment, talk of inflation linked to talk of an energy crisis is being wielded against at least two progressive agendas, the Biden infrastructure push and the global push for net zero. It will no doubt soon rear its head in Eurozone fiscal policy debate as well. I'm going to be coming back to this issue in future newsletters. It is at the heart of a new piece forthcoming in The New Statesman. I want to focus in today's newsletter on a particularly urgent issue, food prices. Generally, when we think about the 1970s and early 1980s, we think about OPEC lines at petrol stations, inflation and labor unrest in the U.S. and Europe. Perhaps we might think of the tensions in Eastern Europe that culminated in the Declaration of Martial Law in Poland in 1981, or the beginning of the era of the Latin American debt crisis. But from a global point of view, one of the most severe symptoms of the crisis in the early 1970s was the spike in food prices, coinciding with starvation and famine conditions in some of the poorest countries in the world. Over the following decades, from their peaks in the early 1970s, world food prices fell by almost 50% in real terms. They did not begin to rise again sharply until the early 2000s, reaching a new peak in 2008, and then again in 2011, just ahead of the Arab Spring protests. Increases in global food prices put particularly heavy pressure on food importers. The countries of the Middle East and North Africa are the most dependent on food imports in the world. Against this backdrop, it was big news in the last couple of weeks when the FAO sounded the alarm. The FAO's Food Price Index indicates that world food prices have surged above their 2011 level and are now at a level, in real terms, not seen since the 1970s. Real terms, in this context, refers to the price of food benchmarked against the price of other goods. There is no doubt that this is a very... There is no doubt that this is bad, very news for food... There is no doubt that this is very bad news for poor countries. It will be a matter of urgent concerns for UN agencies. A food price squeeze will compound the devastating impact of 2020 on the world's poorest. 
768 million people, nearly 1 in 10 globally, were undernourished in 2020, up from 118 million in 2019. In a vast redistribution of income, hundreds of billions of dollars will be transferred from low-income and middle-income food importers to agriculture exporting countries. As the FAO reports, developing countries face a 21% jump in the total import bill for food compared with a 6% increase for the richest ones. It is a serious situation, and it can appear even more so if one combines it with the other crisis du jour, the energy crisis. As the saying goes, modern agriculture is a mechanism for turning fossil fuels into food. Not just through mechanized farm machinery, but crucially through artificial food fertilizers. Natural gas is the feedstock for 95% of the production of ammonia, which in turn is the key ingredient for the production of nitrogen-based fertilizers. So, rising global gas prices will feed into rising fertilizer prices, which will feed into higher farm gate prices for food. As the Nobel Institute explains, Manufacturing one ton of anhydrous ammonia fertilizer requires 33,500 cubic feet of natural gas. This cost represents most of the costs associated with manufacturing anhydrous ammonia. When natural gas prices are $2.50 per thousand cubic feet, the natural gas used to manufacture one ton of anhydrous ammonia fertilizer costs $83.75. If the price rises to $7 per thousand cubic feet of natural gas, the cost of natural gas used in manufacturing that ton of anhydrous ammonia rises to $234.50, an increase to the manufacturer of $150.75. In Asia in October, gas prices briefly touched a peak of in excess of $34 per thousand cubic feet. The price since then have eased, but the implications are clearly serious. In Europe, the surge in gas prices has been most extreme in the UK. 10 small firms supplying almost 2 million households have failed, leaving open the question of continuity of supply. Brexit-induced supply chain difficulties and the abs absence of East European harvest labor have meant that supermarket shelves have sometimes been empty. Taken together, the UK seems, to some observers at least, to be facing a new winter of discontent. The UK is also the home base of a particularly influential financial newspaper, which may account for some of the inflamed tone of the commentary on this coincidence of rising energy prices and nagging supply chain issues. At times, a famine like the one in the 1930s Ukraine has not seemed far away, and the panic, cue hand-waving, has something to do with climate activists, state interventionism, and net zero. This is a discursive knot that desperately needs untangling. I want to focus here on the global food price issue. The rise in global food prices is a huge deal that demands urgent attention at the UN level. It is crucial that the budgets of all relevant aid agencies be adequately funded so that food supplies can be maintained. Importing countries must have the foreign exchange they need. The World Food Program has sounded the alarm. High food prices are hunger's new best friend. We already have conflict, climate, and COVID-19 working together to more poor, more push more people into hunger and misery. Now food prices have joined that deadly trio, said WFP chief economist Arif Hussein. If you're a family that already spends two-thirds of your income on food, hikes in the price of food already spell trouble. Imagine what they mean if you've already lost part or all of your income because of COVID-19. A record 270 million people are estimated to be acutely food insecure or at high risk in 2021. A 74% jump from 2020, driven by conflict, economic shocks, natural disasters, the socioeconomic fallout from COVID-19, and now food price hikes. In 2021, WFP, World Food Program, is undertaking the biggest operation in its history, targeting 139 million people worldwide. 
It is also true that there is more and more evidence to suggest that climate change is impacting global food supplies. To name just two examples, both the U.S. and Brazil are suffering from serious drought. It is more than likely that the high energy prices will in due course feed through to farm gate prices by way of fertilizer costs. But it is very unlikely that energy is a major driver of the escalation of food prices we have seen so far. The timing is just not right. The escalation in key commodity prices began months before the surge in fertilizer prices began to make itself felt. The serious implications are for prices in 2022, not in 2021. Finally, it is altogether implausible to attribute any of these price increases, either those we have seen so far or those that are likely to be in the pipeline, to climate policy. Climate change, yes, but climate policy, no. Net zero may be a slogan to be heard everywhere, but regrettably, it has had far too little real impact so far. As for the analogies to the 1970s, if they serve a purpose in alerting the authorities to the need to take urgent action to avoid a food crisis, so be it. But in looking more closely at the data, I have run into some real puzzles. I may be barking up the wrong tree with the following thoughts, so take the above as read and let me put the following in a separate section, which comes with a health warning. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we are starting that separate section. You've received your health warning. Let us begin. The FAO Food Price Index, which appears to show that in real terms, food prices are now close to their 1970s levels, is a complicated beast. Its makeup is explained well in this useful FAO slide deck, and there's a link provided. It is clearly a mistake to read this index as a food price index. It is not an index of what consumers actually pay. It is really a commodity price index, more relevant for producers than consumers. But what is puzzling me is the way it is adjusted to reflect relative price movements. In other words, the way we move from a nominal food price index to a thing we call a real price index. This is the adjustment which generates the remarkable conclusion that food prices today are as high as they were in the crisis period of the early 1970s. My worry about this claim arises from the simultaneous publication of another report on the world food situation. This too was offered, authored by the FAO, but this one is published in collaboration with the OECD. The OECD FAO report also contains a table on the long-run development of real food prices. And it is this graph which is causing me the headaches. It shows the 1970s price spike. It shows the 2008 and 2011 spikes. But the current spike is not really showing up. Rather than a composite index, the OECD FAO graph shows the price of soybeans, wheat, maize, beef, and pork separately. Together, they make up a substantial part of the FAO food price index, and according to the OECD FAO calculations, in real terms, they are up slightly relative to 2020, but they remain far below their 1970s peaks. To reiterate, these are separate price series for particular commodities, but these are very important commodities. Given their weight in the FAO food index, it is hard to see statistically how one can reconcile the two charts. Indeed, it is hard to see economically how it could be true that if the real prices of these commodities are this low, the prices for other commodities in the FAO's index could be at 1970 levels in real terms. For traders, there would be a gigantic opportunity for arbitrage between crops. And why would any farmer continue to produce wheat if all wheat commands are the kind of prices being shown in the OECD FAO numbers, whilst other commodities are commanding the kind of staggering prices implied by the FAO food price series? There is something wrong here. 
The discrepancy is huge and it is not recent. What is going on? I cannot be the first person to notice this. I must be missing something. My first thought was that the problem is not in the commodity prices, but in the price for other goods to which they are being compared. The widely quoted FAO food price is deflated by the Manufacturer's Unit Value Index of the World Bank, whereas the OECD FAO table uses the U.S. GDP deflator. As the OECD FAO reports, that may create a difference. For a description of the index and its components, please refer to the special features on FFPI in this and that and in this and that. The outlook uses US GDP deflator 24 to 2016 equals 1 to obtain the index in real terms. As a result, the real FFPI in the outlook is different from what is published in the FAO. Reading that footnote came as a relief. The OECD FAO analysts see the discrepancy too and attribute it to the deflators. That was the hypothesis that Cameron Abadi and I discussed on Ones and Twos, my other work. It is an intuitively plausible idea. If the World Bank price index used by the FAO to do the deflation is measuring manufacturer's unit value, it might well exhibit a strong downward tendency. After all, we have become very, very efficient at making manufactured goods. It would not be implausible to suggest that a bushel of wheat buys you far more computer or cell phone in 2021 than it did in 1973. That is what it means to say that the real price is as high now as it was in the early 1970s. To be sure, I thought I would email the official at the FAO responsible for the index. They responded, pointing out that the FAO index has far more components than the few commodities listed by the OECD FAO, but broadly agreeing with my hunch that the action was probably in the deflators, in other words, the price series to which the food prices were compared. But could the discrepancy really be large enough? I decided I really ought to check the underlying price indices themselves. Did the World Bank's Manufacturer's Unit Value Index used by the FAO to produce the headline about the 1970s, diverge as strongly from the U.S. GDP deflator used in the far less dramatic OECD FAO numbers as I supposed. To offer a satisfactory, satisfaction, to offer a satisfactory explanation, the MUV would need to plunge below the GDP deflator. So, it was a bit of a shock to discover this. The two deflators really don't diverge at all. Admittedly, the World Bank MUV index is rather obscure. I may have got hold of the wrong index, but this is the kind of thing that makes you go, hmm, I'm a bit stumped. I've fired off more emails to the person at the FAO. Maybe they can help. Right now, Amidst all the talk of stagflation and energy crisis, I'm worried that we have this story about food wrong too. Not only is the link to energy being seriously overplayed and for bad reasons, but the idea that we are back in the 1970s in real terms may be quite misleading. I hope I may simply be misreading the number somehow. If anyone can resolve the puzzle, I would be very grateful. Watch this space. Ladies and gentlemen, we just learned about food price indices, inflation, and deflators. Very informative. But you know what I loved the most? I loved that Mr. Adam Tooze, an accomplished author, economist, historian, accomplished, has no problem saying, I don't know. I don't know. I have come across some work, some academic papers, from back in the day and it's my sense that they had no problem back then saying I've done a lot of research and here's what I've come up with and I'm unsatisfied with my results can you guys help me because I don't know I thought I would come to some sort of 
final conclusion, something that wraps it all up, but I haven't. These days, when you read a report, it's always certain. The answer is this. You never, not never, but it's so rare to have someone say, I don't know, and I'm looking to you for help. So refreshing. Oh, I shouldn't bring this up right now because this is about food prices, but there was a fantastic piece in the Smithsonian about in 2017, the Smithsonian Magazine, uh, about the 1918 Spanish flu. And it was an in-depth piece by an author who wrote a book on the 1918 flu. And his conclusion at the end of this remarkable article that was published in 2017, what is the number one lesson, he said, from all of this? The number one lesson is you must be honest as a government official, as a person of authority. You must be honest. You must say, we don't know. We believe it could be this, it could be that. We're looking for more information. Here's our plan. We're gonna keep an open mind, but at this point, we're not 100% certain. As opposed to, oh, it's definitely this. I know for sure, da, 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 da. And then guess what? You step right into it and it's covered in you know what. And then you say, no, my shoes were always brown. And people look at you and say, I'm not gonna trust what that person tells me anymore. Okay, I've taken a complete detour away from Mr. Tooze's work. But I wanted to commend him not only for the great analysis, not only for, yes, the great analysis, all his work, all his work, which you can find at Substack. Adam Tooze. You know how to spell Adam. Tooze is spelled T-O-O-Z-E dot Substack dot com. This is again chart book number 47. Crisis Talk. Global Food Prices. October 24th, 2021 to you tomorrow.